Great, thanks. Uh, is the mic working? Is everyone good with hearing me? Fantastic. Um, so yes, that's my talk, uh, Bayesian model comparison for radial velocity, one, two, three, or many planets. And when I was given this talk title and was putting the talk together, I realized that a lot of people um, attending this meeting don't necessarily work on radial velocity. And in fact, some people here aren't even interested in this particular question of how many planets can be inferred from a particular data set. So rather than alienate a large fraction of people here, I'm just going to give a general talk on Bayesian model comparison and sort of the uh, pragmatic aspects of that. And I'll throw up a couple examples of doing this in the context of radial velocity because that's my particular specialty. OK. Um, so my talk is effectively broken down into three parts. And the first part is kind of intro material, defining what the evidence is and base factors. You've seen this in Eric's uh, talk and in David Kipping's talk. But I'll also talk about how this plays into um, the philosophy of decision making. Um, in the second part, I'm going to be a bit more practical and talk about how you could officially, efficiently compute uh, fully marginalized likelihoods, evidence, those kind of things. And then in the very last part, I'll talk about cross-validation as kind of a nice alternative uh, to maybe using a BIC or computing a Bayes factor. This is actually a frequentist method, but I think it's worth addressing. Okay, so uh, let's go through some intro material. Um, this is Bayes' theorem, as you've seen from previous lectures. Perhaps you're even getting sick of seeing this equation. But I'm a big fan of rote learning, so let's just go through this one more time. Um, the posterior probability distribution on your vector of model parameters given your data set is proportional to your prior probability distribution on that vector of parameters times your likelihood function, which is the probability of generating that data set given um, uh, some, uh, that set of model parameters for specific values. Um, I'll go over what the denominator is, and that's, this is going to be the main focus of the talk. Um, but I hope you guys realize that when you see Bayes' theorem written like this, it's really shorthand. Because implicitly what's going on here is there's assumptions that aren't being uh, explicitly written out. Um, and so we can encapsulate that uh, by invoking this parameter m, which uh, says everything about our particular model. Okay, so this tells us about all the underlying um, assumptions that we're making, the hypotheses that we're making. Um, it tells us about the uh, how we're parameterizing your problem. It tells us about our noise model. M is basically everything. OK. So uh, you could imagine that M is like a one-planet model, or it's a two-planet model, or maybe it's an n-planet model, or an n-planet model plus some stellar activity signal. Um, and it's applied to this particular data set D. Okay. So imagine that you get some data set. And now you uh, want to perform an MCMC on it and get your uh, posterior distribution on your parameters. Um, before you actually do that, you had to make a decision. You had to say, what model am I going to apply to this particular data set? And how am I going to make that decision? Okay, and that's what this talk is really all about. Uh, so this term of the denominator here is something often called the Bayesian evidence. I prefer to call it the fully marginalized likelihood, because this is uh, really descriptive of what you're actually doing uh, to the thing in the denominator. So, the posterior probability distribution is, of course, a probability distribution, so it has to normalize to 1. Um, or, yeah, it has to normalize to 1. So you could think of the denominator as integrating uh, the numerator over all of d theta. So you're integrating over your prior times likelihood over all of d theta. And so uh, what this reads as is uh, the probability of the data given uh, some general model. So this is very different from, say, like a likelihood function or figuring out a maximum likelihood. Um, because I'm integrating over all of theta, and so this is basically telling me the general quality of a particular model. I'm not just relying on like a point estimate. I'm uh, integrating over all of uh, theta space and uh, saying something about the general quality of this model. Um, unfortunately, just computing this isn't very useful on its own. Um, so you can imagine if I do this integral and I get a number that's like 10 to the minus 10, well, what do I do with that, right? You know, is, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Because there's theoretically an infinite number of models that we could have applied here. And um, without some way to compare uh, various probabilities, then I can't really make a good decision. Okay, So rather than consider an infinite number of models, let's just consider two models, model A and model B. Um, they could be nested models. Uh, they could be completely different models. Um, but they effectively, uh, there's some difference between them. OK, so I could compute uh, what the probability of each of these uh, models are by integrating uh, the parameters in uh, model A. So I'd be integrating over theta A. 
and integrating the parameters of uh, model B, which would be theta B, and then the ratio of these probabilities is something called a base factor, which is something that we saw in, uh, in Eric's talk. And additionally, we can place priors on the models themselves. So if some previous experiment told us that maybe one pro uh, model was significantly more probable than the other model, then I can incorporate this information here, and then by multiplying the base factor by this ratio on, uh, of the priors of our models, then I get something out called the posterior odds ratio. Okay. So you can imagine that if the uh, probability of these models were equally weighted, then the base factor is basically equal to the posterior odds ratio. Okay. So now that I've sort of defined these things, you know, how do I do this? How do I use this in practice? What do I actually do with the information that uh, gets spit out here? Um, sort of one sort of the, the kind of first order thing you might do is that, well, you know, if you look at your result and see that the base factor or posterior odds ratio was very huge, say like 10 to the 10, 10 to the 20, 10 to the something huge, then uh, you would generally want to favor model A because that's going to be more probable. Um, if the base factor was really small, say 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 20, then maybe you might favor model B. But in a lot of cases, when you compute these evidences, um, it may not be very decisive. So uh, these might be close to unity, or maybe the difference uh, in probability of these models only span a couple orders of magnitude. And so therefore you couldn't say anything horribly decisive um, about uh, favoring one model versus the other. Okay, and this kind of leads uh, to my first takeaway point, which is model comparison is actually not the same thing as model selection. Okay. So I don't know if this was common sense or not, or if uh, this kind of comes as a surprise. Um, but uh, there's basically two reasons why, um, why I don't think this is true. Um, model comparison, all it, does you, it, all it does is give you probabilities. It just tacks on numbers to a particular model. To actually select a particular model um, is also a function of some outside factors, which some people will call a cost function or a utility. So for example, if I compute a Bayes factor, for two models and it turns out to be 20. Okay, so like model A was 20 times more probable than model B. Um, you know, maybe that's the result that I got, but what if the less probable model had like such revolutionary ideas in physics that if it were true would get you the Nobel Prize in physics? You know, how you would write that up in a paper will very greatly depend on, you know, how uh, noteworthy that model might be. So even though you have these numbers saying which model might be more probable, maybe it's worth it to you know, mention this less probable model because it has much more interesting ideas behind it and that will drive um, sort of the content of the, in the grants that you'll write or maybe your job applications or the uh, papers that you write. Um, you might think of it another example where you know, you're building some pipeline for some automated telescope and you need to make a decision very, very quickly. Um, but one model takes like a microsecond to compute and the other model takes or requires like 100,000 CPU hours in order to compute. So, you know, is it, worth, uh, is it worth doing that computation in order to make an accurate decision? Okay, so you kind of have to consider these practical factors when, when doing a model selection. Um, and again, this is effectively what your cost function or utility are. Okay, so maybe you want to ignore all that, you don't really care about that kind of thing. Um, but even then, uh, the most rigorous thing to do is actually to average all of your models, not necessarily select w uh, the most probable model. Okay, so the posterior probability distribution on a particular set of parameters, given some data, would be basically the sum of the posterior probability of a particularly given model weighted by the model itself. Um, this is basically the most rigorous thing to do. And this may not make a whole lot of sense in the context of like, a one planet model versus a two planet model versus a three planet model because you know you can't really have a fraction of a planet or the planets in some kind of quantum state. Um, but this does make a bit of sense if you want to predict new data, right? So if you have if there's some plausibility that uh, if you have like a one planet model or a two planet model, one planet model looks more probable. But there's some plausibility for a two planet model, and you want to predict what new data are going to look like. You should incorporate both of those models and use their probabilities as amplitudes to which you mix them, okay? And then when you actually go out and observe new data, then if it turns out that uh, the data that you observe actually did in fact favor the two planet model, you didn't arbitrarily, you didn't arbitrarily throw out the two planet model to begin with. So um, you saved that information and uh, you made the correct discovery. <clears throat> 
Okay. So enough with like the philosophy of doing uh, base factors and model selection. So now let's look at how you would efficiently compute some of these integrals. Okay. So Eric talked a little bit about some of the things I'll uh, discuss here, but I'm going to go into excruciating detail about a couple of them. Um, first, I'd just like to note again, uh, this is the integral we're trying to compute. It's all over all of d theta. And the second takeaway point, as Eric pointed out, is that this integral is very hard. right? Um, but you can imagine if you only have two parameters here, or maybe one parameter, um, that maybe you can just do uh, integrate this analytically. If you can't do it that way, maybe you can use something like Monte Carlo integration and just kind of brute your force your way to a solution. Um, but once you get to like three or more parameters, um, there's even some cases where d theta is thousands of dimensions, this integral becomes very, very difficult. That's why I like to call this thing the fully marginalized likelihood because the acronym is FML, and this thing is a nightmare to compute. So, um, but fortunately for us, scientists like hard problems, and so, uh, uh, some scientists have actually focused on how to compute this integral robustly. Okay. So there's actually an entire literature out there on how to compute this integral efficiently. And a lot of this has been motivated by um, some controversial planet discoveries. So people have often wondered, well, you know, if I add an additional planet, um, should, you know, does that extra information, uh, is that extra information warranted um, against you know, the additional parameters that I, that I invoked in that particular model? Um, so from here, I'm going to discuss several methods that uh, will compute uh, that have been used to compute this integral, um, mostly in the context of you know how many plants are in my data. Um, the methods that I'll describe uh, isn't necessarily comprehensive. So if you have a particular method that um, isn't included here, it's not like some personal grudge or anything. Um, I just I'm limiting to some things that I know uh, something about. Um, and again, it's not a personal grudge against anyone if I leave your method out. Okay, so um, there's one method called thermodynamic integration, which um, David Kipping, I think, brought up initially, but was also mentioned in Eric's talk. And the idea behind thermodynamic integration is that you're going to use this method called parallel tempering MCMC. And so remember from David's talk, that's basically kind of like doing a bunch of MCMCs in parallel at different temperatures, right? And so you have multiple MCMCs with the likelihoods taken to some uh, power. So you can see the likelihood taken to the power of beta. So if beta was equal to 0, then I'd effectively be drawing from my prior. If beta was equal to 1, then I'm sampling from what I want to sample from, which is uh, the prior times likelihood. So you know, low values of beta kind of soften uh, the prior times likelihood. So um, this works really well if you have a multimodal distribution that you want to try to sample from. Um, so if I wanted to compute a fully marginalized likelihood, uh, at beta, then this is what it would look like, um, again, with the likelihood taken to the power of beta. But um, through some relatively simple derivation, you can find that you can actually compute the evidence um, from this integral over d beta for this particular quantity. And this quantity here is the average log likelihood at beta. Okay, so if, if you can imagine all those different temperature levels and just consider like one of them, um, what you're effectively computing is like the average value of the log likelihood at that temperature level. And then you do it for each of the individual temperature levels. And then um, you can uh, do some like discrete sum or something to uh, approximate this integral here. And then that will effectively give you the evidence for that particular model. Okay. So um, advantages behind this, uh, if you're already using parallel tempering MCMC to actually do your parameter estimation, this is kind of like a nice side effect of actually performing it. You actually have all the information available in order to compute this integral. So again, it's sort of a nice uh, thing that you can just get out of uh, doing MCMC. But you might think, okay, this algorithm is really complicated. I don't want to code it up myself. Um, fortunately, it is already implemented in MC if you're using that. Um, and there's actually a method uh, that Dan wrote to actually compute uh, the evidence through thermodynamic integration. So if you have the patience and uh, you know, you've tested this on your problem and you know that, uh, that, it, that it works pretty well, you can use this to compute the integral. Okay. Um, some caveats. So I, I think the main issue of using this is that you really need a robust estimate of the average value of the log likelihood at every beta. Okay. So if you don't sample well enough at one particular temperature, then this value might be skewed in a, in a particular direction and it won't be an accurate estimate. And so when you integrate over all of your d beta, then you're going to get uh, an off value for what the evidence is. 
Um, there's another method that's sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, it's called important sampling. And you can use this to evaluate an integral. You can use it for a number of other things. So I'm just going to briefly discuss what important sampling is all about and how you can use it to compute the evidence. So uh, imagine that we have the uh, integrand or prior times likelihood, which is the solid blue curve um, represented in one dimension. Um, again, I want to compute the integral of this, but I don't know its normalization. But say I had another function, g of theta, which I did know the normalization of. Okay? Um, and that's represented by this uh, dashed red curve. And in the, uh, I could multiply the integrand by g over g, and I haven't really done anything to change the value of it. I'm just multiplying by 1. But what I've effectively done is I've tricked this integral into looking like I'm taking an expectation value. Right? So you remember like expectation values from like your intro to quantum classes and like figuring out positions of particles and stuff. That's kind of like what's going on right here. So um, I can compute this integral by taking a whole bunch of samples from the red curve and then evaluating those samples at uh, the prior times likelihood and at g of theta. Okay? And I don't actually know if this is the reason it's called important sampling, but you can kind of see when you evaluate it at each of the individual thetas, you know, some values here are basically kind of more important than others. So you know, here you evaluate it here, and, um, and at the top of the curve, you, know, you see that's more important than uh, the red curve, and then over here, the red curve is more important than that. And you're basically averaging over that ratio, and then that will effectively give you an estimate of the uh, evidence. Okay. Um, but the trick behind important sampling is that um, you really need to pick a good g of theta. Okay? You need to pick a distribution that will uh, sample from this very efficiently. And so if, imagine if you make this distribution too narrow relative to your prior times likelihood, that um, you'd be able to sample from the mode very, very well. But because we're integrating over all of theta, we wouldn't be able to sample the wings very well. Okay? If instead we made the distribution too wide, then uh, we'd be able to sample from the tails very well. But in a high dimensional model, we'd be unlikely to sample from the mode very well. So you kind of have to balance between you know, how wide you make this distribution. Um, in an ex example I'm going to show soon, uh, we kind of uh, skirt that issue by truncating the distribution at some arbitrary values. And so it's like, sweet, we can just you know, restrict our uh, sampling to this space and don't have to worry about the tails here. But there's an obvious problem with this, right? And it's that I'm throwing out all the information here and here. So I'm only getting like a fraction of what the evidence value is. Okay, so how can we actually supplement that information that we just lost? Um, one way you could do it is if you had previously run an MCMC on this particular model. So it's like you ran an MCMC and then you decided later, I want to compute the evidence for it. Um, if you find out how many of your MCMC samples fell within the subspace tau, if you compute the fraction of MCMC samples that fell within the subspace, then the fraction of MCMC samples times the evidence should roughly equal um, this sum over here, okay? And so I can rearrange this equation to put the FMCMC on uh, the other side, and then that will be my estimate for the evidence, okay? So what are sort of the advantages and caveats behind this? Um, the good thing about important sampling is that it is embarrassingly parallel. And what I mean by that is that, say I have a certain workload, I want to draw like a million samples, I can easily farm that out into uh, parallel tasks, okay? So it's a very uh, parallel algorithm. Um, if I've already done an MCMC and I decided now I want to compute the evidence, well, I'm already part way there. I can actually use the information from the posterior samples in order to compute the evidence. Um, some general problems, again, uh, choosing a G of theta or um, sort of this truncated uh, G of theta, uh, you know, it will, the performance will depend on that. And also you need a robust estimate for the fraction of MCMC samples that fall in here. So if you imagine that you had like a posterior sample of like 10,000, but only one actually fell in the spin, that's not exactly a robust estimate of you know, how many fraction, with the fraction of samples that really fall in that bin. Okay. So we applied this to a real problem. We applied this to the planetary system of Gliese 876. Um, this was something I did with an undergrad at UT San Antonio, uh, Seth Pritchard. And in this plot, is what is shown are five different models applied to a radio velocity data set for Gliese 876. Um, you can see it ranges from the most probable, this is the uh, log evidence up top, to least probable down here. And these are the five different models. This is like a five planet or four planet model, five planet model, um, the three inner planets, the three outer planets. And you're seeing how this estimate evolves with the number of important samples. Okay. So that's another issue with um, kind of computing these things is that you want to have an estimate for the evidence that's actually converged. So 
you know, often in papers, some people will write like, oh, we just did, you know, the Bayesian evidence and computed this. You know, convergence is a big issue here. So, um, you know, look at what methods people are using and see if the estimate is actually robust. And so you can actually compute what the variance in this uh, estimator is. Um, but you can see that on this scale, it's not very much. Um, but basically what we concluded from this is that uh, from our subset of models, the four planet one was most probable. Okay. Um, the good news is that I um, do have this code up on GitHub. So if you actually wanna try to use important sampling for your own problem, whether it be radio velocity or you wanna adapt it to your particular data set, um, the code is here. Um, features that it include, there is an IPython notebook uh, that uh, has these various things where you can generate synthetic radio velocities from some arbitrary input system. Uh, we also have an MCMC in there uh, incorporating an n-body model so you can actually model a planetary system with n-body effects here. And there's a step-by-step -step tutorial on doing the whole important sampling algorithm. Um, and I'd also like to note to, uh, for you guys to check out John Bovert's poster, um, we're basically applying this algorithm to several dozen um, radio velocity systems in order to uncover new companions. So um, I would check out his poster on what we're up to. Okay. So there's various other methods that people employ. Nested sampling has been mentioned a whole bunch of times. Um, there are, it is a popular method and uh, like people have mentioned, uh, multi-nest is available. There's even pi multi-nest if you want a Pythonic interface to multi-nest. Um, there's also uh, code written by uh, Brendan Brewer. Um, wow like DNEST and the trans-dimensional MCMC, which is kind of a fun algorithm. It actually fits the number of planets as like a model parameter to a set of radio velocity data. So, um, I mean, multi, and this happens within a nested sampling algorithm. So um, it's a very popular method. And in terms of like the science, it, uh, science questions that it investigates, um, you can use it to determine, uh, at least in David Kipping's papers, he's mentioned that you can use it to determine evidence for exomoons. Um, functional forms of the eccentricity distribution, and um, in some nested sampling algorithms, it has been applied to the issue of how many planets are in my data. Um, there's another method called Geometric Path Monte Carlo, um, which um, was done by David Hogg's group. Um, it's kind of this weird blend of, or at least mathematically, it kind of looks like this weird blend of doing thermodynamic integration and important sampling, um, but it's also been used uh, for uh, testing end planets for various radio velocity observations. And as David Kepping asked about earlier about the savage dicky density ratio, um, I mean, I'm just gonna leave these points uh, to, uh, to the uh, answer that Eric had, but I will say that there was the science application to measuring the mass for this Mars sized exoplanet um, in Kepler 138, okay. Um, so finally, I wanted to talk about cross-validation as a nice alternative to um, doing uh, either the more traditional BIC and AIC or uh, computing Bayes factors. So from Eric's talk and mine, you know, we've discussed these various methods and I was thinking about, well, how do I kind of like nicely summarize the advantages and disadvantages of these methods um, in some kind of visualization? So here I've computed computational difficulty um, ranging from super, super easy on the left to incredibly difficult on the right. And then on the vertical axis is the number of assumptions that I'm making. So this is kind of like sort of the simplification, the degree of simplification in my model from basically, you know, very loose assumptions to very strong assumptions. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. I was like, oh my God, it's over already. Um, and so if we plotted these methods up, um, we have AIC and BIC kind of in the upper left-hand corner um, where it's very computationally easy, but you make loads of assumptions. Um, base factors and posterior odds ratios kind of have a spectrum to them. So for very few parameter models, um, it can be somewhat easy, but then for like thousands of dimensions, it can be pretty difficult. You wouldn't want to be up in the right-hand corner for any reason. I don't know what method this would be, but just stay out of it. Um, the lower left-hand corner is ideally where we want to be, right? So something that's super easy, but um, isn't as assumption-laden as say like uh, AIC and BIC. So maybe instead the space we should draw upon is, you know, in this direction. So, you know, we kind of want to stay here where things are, you know, pretty computationally easy, but aren't making too many assumptions. So is there sort of some nice balance between doing uh, this and this? And I think there is um, in the method of cross-validation. So I'm going to briefly describe uh, how that works and how you might be able to apply it to your problem. Okay, so in this slide, I'm basically showing cross-validation in terms of uh, kind of the pseudocode up here. So what I want to compute is the cross-validation likelihood for a particular model. So I'm going to apply a model 
uh, to a particular data set, and then I'm going to I'm going to initialize the cross validation likelihood to one, um, and then I'm going to consider my data set, and I'm going to loop over uh, all the datum uh, in my uh, data set, uh, or yeah, I should, I'll go over every uh, datum in my data set, uh, yeah, and uh, the first thing I want to do is get the parameters um, theta bracket d um, that optimize on the data without that particular data point. So I'm considering my full data set here, but then I'm going to leave out the first data point, and I'm going to find a best fit, okay, without that first data point. And then I'm going to compute the probability of that missing data point conditioned on the uh, best fit uh, model. And so what effectively this is doing is um, computing a prediction. It's seeing how the best fit model predicts the missing data point. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. And I'm going to loop over basically all my uh, all the individual data points in here, and uh, I have a little animation to show this. So the x is the data point that I'm leaving out, and then you can see the curve wiggling around. That's basically the best fit model without the data point that's shown by the x. And you can see that the model in general predicts the x value or the uh, missing data point pretty well because there isn't very much there isn't a whole lot of variation there. But there is like that one as you probably saw, um, when this data point went missing, right, the best fit curve uh, does a very poor job at predicting that missing data point, right? But the whole point of doing cross-validation isn't to say like, oh, well, it missed that data point, well, so then it's bad. Um, it's trying to find an overall quality of that particular model, right? So it did really well for a bunch of these, but it kind of missed that one, but it will still give you a probability of um, how well that model predicts data. And cross-validation doesn't necessarily have to be this leave one out procedure. You can leave two out, you can leave n out. Um, you, if you have an image, you can leave out like patches of the sky. Um, so this is kind of a nice balance between doing uh, sort of the more simpler methods of model comparison and computing Bayes factors. Um, because you just have to optimize on a particular data set um, however many of times you're leaving uh, data out in that data set. Okay? So, um, Again, the point of doing cross-validation is that you would do this for one particular model, and then you would choose another model and do the exact same procedure, but on that model. And then whichever model has uh, the largest cross-validation likelihood you would want to prefer. And then you would lead, you'd use that information to in, inform your decision making. Okay, so if I had some general takeaway points, like don't like take these too literally, but these are just kind of like general points that I would recommend just depending on the context of your problem, like what model comparison method you'd want to use. Okay. So um, if you need to make many rough decisions very quickly, um, like on the order of milliseconds, like if time is of the essence in your particular problem, then AIC and BIC aren't necessarily the worst ideas. You, you might be able to use them. You might be able to justify that. Um, if you really have decent computational resources and time, if it's kind of the case where you obtain some data and then you really have to sit down and think, well, what's the best model I should apply, um, then base factors and posterior odds ratio um, would work generally well there, especially if you really understand your priors and utility. If your problem is somewhat in between this, then cross-validation could be another uh, option. And I think I'd probably like to conclude that, you know, it's not really like pick one or the other. Um, like it's been mentioned before, you want to use multiple methods to kind of demonstrate the robustness of your result, right? So if you decided that you're going to compute a Bayes factor um, to do model comparison, you know, also maybe try cross-validation to see if that, um, if that result is robust, okay? So um, I'll just leave my conclusions here. Again, model selection uh, isn't the same thing as model comparison. How you actually decide depends on sort of the more practical factors. It depends on your utility. Um, for three or more uh, parameter models, uh, computing fully marginalized likelihoods are hard, um, but it's a really active problem, um, even in the exoplanet literature. So um, chances are there's a method out there that uh, you could apply to your particular problem. Um, and if not, then people are probably working on it. Um, and for a tutorial on actually using the important sampling to compute fully marginalized likelihoods, um, my code is, is up there, so feel free to use it. Send me questions or comments, I'd be happy to help out. And with that, I'll conclude. Thanks. Right. So actually, to to jump onto that point, there's something that I didn't really emphasize here that now I realize probably should have been. 
Um, so sort of model complexity and how you penalize for that. You have like the BIC and AIC and you just kind of say like, here's my number of model parameters and this is, the, num the number of model parameters is kind of how is proportional to what I'm gonna penalize it by. With doing base factors and to some degree with doing cross validation, it naturally penalizes you uh, for adding more parameters to your model. So in the case of cross validation, um, a more complex model will have less predictive power. And so if you invoke some super complex model and then you remove a data point, well then when you optimize your curve, it's gonna to have to make some drastic change than if the data point had been originally left in there. So it's kind of like this natural way of penalizing more complex models. And the same happens with base factors. You have to integrate over all the parameters. And so that effectively penalizes a more complex model. Right. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm actually not sure. This approach is, is, is sort of like that. This, this approach is very much like doing jackknife estimation, if people are familiar with that. It kind of does this leave one out procedure, but uh, does that to estimate parameters. But this is kind of working in the predictive mode. In terms of like doing bootstrap and working in the predictive mode, like I don't know what that would be called, but maybe there's some theorem on how that could work. So basically, Oh yeah, um, I mean, as far as I'm aware, like base factors are almost as, I mean, it, going this down this far, like you're just basically kind of invoking more, even more complex models. I don't know if there's actually like another method that would just be down over here. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure about that. 